The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hello, and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. My name is James, and on this show, we talk about the equipment found on your electronics workbench. As you might have noticed, things look and sound a little bit different since my last episode. Over the last couple of months, I have been moving, but my lab space isn't quite set up yet to do full videos. However, the Element 14 Presents producers have told me, and I cannot believe I get to say this, that the show must go on. For most projects and circuits, you can get away with just knowing a MOSFET's gate has a threshold voltage that turns it on. But they're actually more complicated than that and have a special event with that voltage. So in this video, I show you the turn on sequence for a MOSFET. Now I did shoot this footage before I moved, but I think we can make it work. For a more detailed look at MOSFETs, I recommend you check out the Learning Circuit episode on them because Karen does a great job explaining the details of how they work. The key thing to remember is that the voltage from the gate to source affects the resistance between the drain and source. Unlike a BJT, there is very little current through the gate. For that reason, many people believe you don't need a resistor. So to see why a gate resistor is a good or bad idea, I built a small test board. Obviously, there is a place for the MOSFET, in this case, a FQP30N06L. The drain and source are connected to a screw terminal. The very small value shunt resistor is to measure the gate current. R2 is the current limiting resistor, which is either going to be a 0 ohm or 3.3K ohm for these tests. There are also pads for a pull-up resistor, a pull-down resistor, and a capacitor. We are not going to use those in this video. The LED and its resistor show when the gate is on. Just in case those affect the measurement, they can be disabled with a solder jumper. Here is the actual board. On this side, the gate signal comes in, and over here, we connect our load to the drain and the source to ground. In these measurements, I am using a 100 ohm resistor as a load, which is connected to a 12 volt bench supply. The gate is driven by an Arduino, which has code that turns the transistor on for one second and then back off for one second. It's nothing fancy, but it does work. The first board we look at has a zero ohm resistor to simulate what happens when you drive the gate with no resistor. Now, sometimes people ask me, why do zero ohm resistors exist? Well, here's a case. We're going to put a zero ohm resistor onto the resistor pads so that we can simulate what it is like to drive the gate without a resistor. I have two active oscilloscope probes attached to this circuit. One is measuring the voltage from gate to source, and the other is measuring the voltage from drain to source. Most oscilloscopes come with passive probes, which work great for most measurements. The reason for active probes in this case is because their loading is extremely small. A typical passive probe might add 10 picofarads to the circuit being measured, while an active probe like this one adds less than one picofarad. These probes will have very little effect on the small MOSFET capacitances that we are trying to measure. The third probe is a Hall effect current probe. It measures the current of the wire by measuring the magnetic field around it. Here, it is connected to the supply wire for the drain. Over on the scope, we can see the voltage on the gate and the drain, and then we can also see the current through the drain. Plus, there is one more bonus signal that I haven't mentioned yet, but I'll get to that. First, I set the sweep mode to normal so that it only triggers when the gate signal turns on. The orange signal does look like a nice sharp edge, doesn't it? Well, when I zoom the time base in, we see something different. Next, the yellow channel measures across the drain and source. And last, I add the green channel, which is the current probe measuring the drain's current. After moving the trigger point to the left side, we can see a lot of interesting behaviors. The orange trace is the gate that the Arduino switches from zero to five volts, but notice how it has a little bit of a ring, stays flat, and then ramps up. The MOSFET is causing that behavior, and it even has a special name. Because of how a MOSFET is made, there are two tiny capacitors inside of it. Let's go back to its schematic symbol. 
one of them is between the gate and source. In fact, you can even see it in the symbol. And the other is between the gate and drain. While you might see values in the datasheet for input and output capacitance, that's not exactly what these capacitors are. The important thing to remember is that these are dynamic. Their capacitance value changes depending on what is going on with the gate and drain, which is why we see that strange plateau. For that reason, we cannot just look at the VGS or VDS signal by themselves. We need to see them together. The gate voltage starts to charge up and stops at about 2.5 volts. That is the same as the threshold voltage for this MOSFET. At that point, the drain starts to conduct, causing it to change from an open to a short, meaning the drain source voltage has to start to drop. The time it takes the drain to drop is relative to the drain gate capacitance. The reason we see this plateau is that while the gate is charged up, the voltage between the gate and drain is changing as the drain drops. This sequence is known as the Miller Plateau or the Miller Capacitance. Now, there was a big mistake and I didn't catch it until after I moved. The green trace is the current through the drain. As the gate charges up, the current through the drain also goes up until it hits its max level. That is when the drain voltage starts to drop. But notice here that there's a gap between where the drain voltage starts to drop and the drain current starts to rise. That phenomenon has nothing to do with transistors. Instead, it was the bald engineer forgetting to de-skew the current and voltage probes. You see, the propagation delay through this current probe is much longer than a voltage probe. So I should have accounted for that skew in my measurements. Since I'm not equipped to redo that measurement at this time, I'm going to cheat and just edit the picture so you can see what the turn on should have looked like. And now this is what a MOSFET looks like when it turns on. What? You might be thinking, James, you said we need a resistor on the gate. Why is that? Well, first, let's go see what happens when we go from zero ohms to three kilo ohms. This other board I put together has a 3.3 kilo ohm series resistor. Everything else is the same. Let's see what its waveforms look like on the scope. Remember, orange is the gate, yellow is the drain, and green is the current. Just like before, the gate seems sharp, except that we are way zoomed in. The gate is actually turning on relatively fast, but it takes way longer for the gate drain capacitance to charge. And that is due to the current limiting resistor now on the gate. You might be wanting to ask me, why does this even matter? Why not just let the transistor turn on as fast as possible? Well, we have to go back to the previous setup and I have to use this probe, which looks like a magic wand and frankly is kind of magic to explain why. I put the magic probe right next to the transistor and then I add it as the purple trace on my scope. And look at that. It shows a huge spike whenever the transistor switches. So what's going on? This probe is called a near field probe. It is used for detecting electromagnetic interference emissions, also known as EMI. And that is one of the things we need to consider with a MOSFET. When it switches on or off, it generates EMI. If we compare that purple waveform to the case where the resistor is slowing down the edge, we can see there is almost no EMI. So it's something to think about. Okay, now you're going to ask me, why not just put a huge resistor like 3.3K on all MOSFET gates? Well, now we have the problem that it takes much longer for the transistor to turn on and they heat up during that turn on period, which is also known as switching losses. Another issue with that larger gate resistor is when you drive an inductive load like a motor, it can cause the MOSFET to self turn on. So as a designer, you have to pick a compromise between a small resistor to reduce the sharp edges, but not so large to cause problems. Determining the right value gets into a bunch of math. But here's a hint, it is rarely going to be over a thousand ohms. I just use that huge 3000 ohms to make a point. Even without doing math, one thing you can do is repeat these kinds of measurements. Carefully measure the gate source voltage 
and the drain source voltage with an oscilloscope to make sure the MOSFET is properly turning on and off and that you don't have any dangerous inductive spikes. Maybe that's something we can cover in another video, or we can discuss that over on the Element 14 community. Follow the link in the description if you would like to talk about these measurements in more detail. Remember that over on Element 14, you'll also find show notes for this episode, which includes links related to transistors, MOSFETs, and these measurements. By the way, that really is the best place to ask me questions because I'm more likely to see them and therefore answer them there. For now, it is time for me to get back to measuring plateaued switches on my partially unpacked electronics workbench. <laughs>